Everyone, thanks for joining us uh, this evening for another Ask the Expert Q&A. Uh, as you'll have seen on the information uh, for the Zoom link, um, tonight's Q&A is with Professor Stephen Seiler, who's a highly respected exercise physiologist, researcher, and he's also a professor of sports sciences at the University of Agder in Norway. He's published over a hundred peer-reviewed papers on exercise physiology and training and this makes him one of the world's leading experts on endurance training. If you haven't already I recommend uh, taking a look at his YouTube channel as um, Stephen's kindly put some really interesting lectures um, and his TED talk that he did a few years ago um, which covers a lot um, that we might cover this evening so I, I recommend taking a look at that. Uh, during his uh, research career, um, for those of you who are joining us from a, sort of an academic background, you'll be aware that he's done both uh, descriptive and experimental studies in various endurance sports, including cycling, running, uh, rowing and cross-country skiing. And in terms of his research, he's probably best known for research on interval training and also the polarised training model, which we'll probably uh, come on to. So I'd just like to, to um, say thanks for joining me tonight, Stephen. It's really good of you to give up your time. Um, I know you've, you've already given up a lot of your time to uh, Oxford Brooks after your talks at the back end of last year. So uh, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you. And uh, I take a trip to Oxford Brooks, whatever, at least every other year. It, so it's uh, I enjoy it. So I'm ready. Let's let's hear some questions. Cool. So for those of you who haven't joined us before, the format is, is simple. So I've been sent some questions uh, by students and also on social media. Uh, so we'll get through these first. And then if we have time, I'll open uh, the floor up to questions at the end of the webinar. So the first question comes from Chris. Uh, Chris says, I understand that your research shows that successful endurance athletes do most of their training at a relatively low intensity. Is this format appropriate for a keen recreational cyclist like me who trains three to four times per week? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I think the answer is yes, uh, probably, because one of the most common mistakes that recreational runners, cyclists, rowers will all do is will tend to kind of let their training intensity move towards a medium, hard, middle intensity essentially every workout and that feels pretty good I, I i get that but what ends up happening is you stagnate quickly you you this monotone kind of load you, you won't become overtrained if you're only training three times four times a week but you just stagnate and so what i would do even with three or four sessions a week is try to mix it up where I would make one of those sessions longer where we're using duration as part of the signal for more adaptation. I would use one of those sessions to be harder, kind of an interval type session. And then maybe the other two, if it was a four day a week program would be more just, you know, uh, traditional aerobic. Uh, the, the popular term is zone two these, these days, meaning below your first lactate turn point, talking pace, two hours on the bike type of workouts. And so even with three or four days a week, I think it's important to have variation in the program and, 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 and use duration. Don't just go out for 45 minutes or an hour. That's a, that's often the mistake is man, a lot of good things happen after the first hour. So, so, but you got to do the first hour to get to the next half hour or next hour, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, and I think you've described this in your previous talks as sort of like being in, sucked into sort of like a black hole whereby every session ends up looking similar in terms of the intensity. And, and have you ever yeah. did you observe that with interval training as well? In that if sometimes if people intuitively think, okay, if I lower my recovery time, um, that's going to be better, but then they end up kind of reducing their overall intensity and it becomes much of a muchness. Yeah, well, with interval training, we can definitely sculpt the interval sessions to a little bit different goals, depending on where the athletes, what they're trying to prepare for. But it is easy for athletes, you know, the body quickly adapts to what it sees regularly. Uh, 
So even in an, even if you get in this, fall into this black hole of using the same interval session all the time, you can also have problems. So I always suggest to athletes, yeah, use, if you have a specific interval session, four times eight minutes or whatever it might be, use it for four weeks, you know, one day a week, each week for four weeks or so, and then switch it up. It, you know, because the body, it's not so sensitive to the exact interval session, but it needs variation. So, so uh, don't be afraid to mix it up a bit in the way you do interval training. Cool. And I think we'll probably come on to that subject a little bit more because some of the, uh, the questions I've, I've received are all sort of based on um, interval training. But I'll go on to the next one, which is um, a really interesting applied sort of programming question. And that came from Scott. And he asks, without lab testing, how do you know when to increase the intensity of your long runs? My schedule prevents me from running longer than two hours. Well, for running, two hours is a good, you know, if you're able to do two hour runs, I think that's quite, quite good as a long run distance. So, uh, so good on you there. Uh, and then what I'm going to be looking at, if, if I'm looking at intensity is obviously I want to see a flat heart rate response. So you shouldn't see a lot of cardiac drift through a two hour run. If you are, then you're, you don't certainly don't need to be going harder. But if you start to see that, wow, I'm, I'm staying really flat for two hours, my legs still feel good, uh, you know, then, then you might consider a small bump. But remember, a little goes a long way uh, because whatever you, you know, if you change pace just a few seconds per kilometer, you're stretching that times two hours. So don't overdo it. And what would you recommend on that, for example, like his two hour run? Would you um, recommend sort of titrating in intensity? So not trying to make the whole session at a greater speed, but maybe um, only segments of it or half of it initially? It, yeah, it could be that you might do it a little bit progressive, uh, you know, a progressive runs, but it depends a little bit on the goal because a progressive two hour run can definitely end up being a hard session. So we need to keep in mind that hard can come from intensity, but it can also come from duration or that combination of intensity and duration. So it might be that in a, you know, initially during the early season, your two hour runs would essentially just be duration focused. You're, you're keeping the intensity low. And then as you start preparing for a half marathon or a marathon, you might do a progressive run uh, as the long run where you're going to purposefully kind of pre fatigue and then you're going to step up the pace uh in the second hour in, in steps you know and, and so that's that's very popular but just be aware that 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 will probably mean that that session will take longer recovery time and that's okay as long as you just are are keen to that okay cool uh, um yeah it's interesting um uh, and we'll, we'll probably come on if we get time i had a couple of questions on sort of determining recovery and, and when you're ready to go again and um, mm. uh, do a hard session. So we'll, we'll probably revisit that subject. Uh, so the, the next few questions are on interval training. And this one, the first one comes from Johan. And he asks, what is your preferred interval training protocol for improving VO2 max? Oh, that's a great question because it allows me to say that there is no magic bullet there. Uh, and I think that's really an important message to get across is that what we see with the best athletes in the world, they do different kinds of interval sessions. They can be anything from six times 10 minutes to four times six minutes to, you know, uh, so, so that, but what we want to achieve is an accumulation of minutes. Uh, and, and what we find with our best athletes and, and a lot of studies that we've done is that athletes will tend to gravitate towards you might what we call zone four, which is just above the second lactate turn point. And it's going to end up being somewhere in that 87 to 92 percent of heart rate max type range. The blood lactate varies depending on the sport, but it's it's not 13. It's more like eight or seven millimolar. So it's above uh, maximum lactate steady state, but it's not crazy high. And, and the athlete is able to maintain good technique. They're able to, to have a fairly relaxed in their discomfort, you know, it, cause it is uncomfortable, but they're, they're accumulating a lot of work time 
as opposed to going up to zone five, as we call it, you know, where we're talking 95% of heart rate max, 10, 11 millimolar lactate, 17, 18, uh, you know, even higher RPE. So it just keep in mind that when we do interval training, it is, it needs to be sustainable because you're going to train hundreds of times in a year, typically, and quite a few of those easily 50 or more will be interval sessions. So, so you need to be able to deal with that mentally, which means you don't make every one a race. Am I right in thinking that um, I seem to remember um, when I was writing the endurance training chapter of my first book is looking at a couple of your studies and you actually did one where you uh, manipulated the interval duration so that there's the session volume was the same, but the intervals were different. Um, could you just, talk a little bit about that what you did in that study if you, i think it was in the early 2000s something like yeah, that. yeah one of the first studies we did was just looking at duration so we did as i recall we did uh either 24 times one minute two to, uh, 12 times two minutes uh six times four minutes or four times six minutes so it all added up to 24 minutes and then we had the athlete we did what we called maximum session effort so we just said Here's the prescription, you know, for example, 12 times two minutes. Now in that study, what we ended up doing, because at the time we didn't have a good basis for something different was we used a rest interval that was the same as the work. So if it was a two minute work period, it was a two minute recovery period. Uh, if I do it, if I did it today, I would do it a bit differently because obviously it was a longer, it was a quite long rest period once you got out to those long intervals, but what we found was that when the athletes did 12 times 24, uh, I mean, 24 times one minute, they were running fast, but they weren't getting, they weren't able to really get a high VO2 response or as high. Uh, what, but once they got up to a two minute re, uh, work period, two, four, or six, there were no significant difference in percentage of heart rate max, blood lactate, and so forth. RPE, it was all the same. So again, we're back to that issue of there's not there's really not a magic bullet, uh, you know, because if you say maximum session effort, the, the, the brain kind of finds the speed that will work at these different uh, durations. And then that, that kind of goes back to your opening point about there not being this sort of optimal protocol. And do you think that maybe things have been overcomplicated in terms of different types of uh, high intensity training protocols, formats, et cetera. But ultimately the muscle adapts to a stimulus, not necessarily like the actual protocol. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I have to say that unfortunately, you know, it's, it's business, you know, <laughs> and so people try to make things complicated because that sells programs and so forth. But uh, some of my colleagues and I, they've, they, we've kind of talked about how the, the, the physiology, yeah, it's, it's pretty complicated. There's a lot of cellular signaling going on, but training is simple. It doesn't need to be rocket science, you know, and, and what we find quite a lot is that these really good athletes, they're not doing very sophisticated programs. They're just doing a lot of work. Yeah. You know, <laughs> there's no shortcuts from that, but they're accumulating. They're just doing good work and they're doing it consistently and they're staying healthy. And that just when we see athletes that have a successful season that reach their goals very often when when the reporter asks, what, what was your key to your success? They just say, I stayed healthy. I stayed motivated. I didn't get injured. And I was able to string together weeks and weeks of good training and good things happen it's that's how that's how hard it is and that's how simple it is yeah i mean that for sure that's that's my experience as well when when you work with very high level athletes it's always that sort of pattern of consistency basically not getting injured good programming and there there isn't this sort of like optimal um protocols of, of different types of hit and that type of thing um, that it's probably it stems from um, a lot of the research that's been done on either like sports science students or recreationally active people where you see like really large improvements in cardiorespiratory fitness and markers of that. And that's communicated in sort of like the mainstream media. And I suppose that's where, you know, people, things um, 
you know, people extrapolate that up to to top level athletes where it doesn't really apply. Oh yeah, it's a great and 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 what I've said in in both talking and and writing is I've said, look, think about Formula One. You know, we have this Formula One circus, so where a lot of the top car companies they have a Formula One program which costs them millions and millions of dollars. Why do they do that? Well, because one of the reasons is, is it is an amazing test arena for technologies. And so a lot of the technologies from the Formula One cars, five years later, they're in the family car. So that you get a scaled down, high tech, you know, the, the technology of the top performances scales down. But the opposite is not true. You don't take the family Ford or the family whatever, you know, and, and say, hmm, we'll just scale this up to a Formula One car. No, it doesn't work at all. And so this is the same, unfortunately, is a lot of studies on untrained people. Yeah, if you go out and do three days a week at 75% of heart rate max, which is going to be your lactate threshold, you do that three times a week for 45 minutes, you'll get better for sure. Definitely works. But then you can't, it doesn't scale up to a high performance athlete. You with me? Yeah. yeah so I mean, that, that's... that has been one of the challenges. And, that, and that's why in, the, in recent last at least 10, 15, 20 years, we've gotten a lot of data from how do the best actually train and what can we learn from it? They're not, you don't need to train 20, 20 hours a week to benefit from their wisdom, but we can learn things, how they do what they do. And it works for the six hour a week athlete also. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, that, that, uh, I'll go on to the next question in just a second, but um, so when I first came across your research about sort of how the elites train and so the polarized model, um, I was first came across that um, in a practical sense when I did some work years ago with um, British Rowan and, and would be involved in a lot of their sessions. And I was really taken aback by just how much of it for a relatively short duration endurance sport of rowing. Um, they were just doing long, long blocks of training day in, day out, like high volumes. And uh, yeah, so it's often I think people think when they think elite is they're training hard all the time. Yeah. It's not necessarily the case with it. And it's the same with endurance athlete uh, runners as well. You see them just going out and uh, doing really long work, a lot of that type of work. And there's actually, yeah, a few very hard sessions, but when they do them hard, they, you know, they're, they're on oh, it. Yeah. Then, you know, Katie bar the door cause they're going to be tough, but uh, that's, that's where we first started seeing this polarized pattern. Uh, was rowers and and cross country skiers and so forth. So uh, it's it's definitely just doing the work is very important, uh, and that's what we've learned. And and it's not. I, I've even said on Twitter, I said, man, a lot of times endurance training is pretty boring, you know, yeah. because you're not getting a big endorphin rush uh, as a as a high level athlete when you're doing a two hour run, but you're just doing you know you're doing the work that needs to be done it's that's what they need and so that's kind of the difference when the 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 uh, recreational athlete that doesn't train very much they say well i want that high that endorphin high and and they get that when you kind of move into that middle intensity zone but unfortunately they get the high but they don't get the adaptations they they kind of start stagnating so if if all you want is the runner's high then go for 45 minutes and, and at your threshold three days a week and that's fine but if you want to run a faster 10K, then it's going to take a bit different approach. Yeah, actually, I'm going to skip to a question, actually, because it sort of it covers what we've just been uh, discussing there. Um, but it asks about distribution. So this one comes from Chris and he says that uh, we know that most endurance athletes train at low to moderate intensity most of the time. However, could this just be because successful endurance athletes are not prepared to change a proven formula? Could it be that doing a moderate volume of race pace type training will produce similar results? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and, and I've actually written that as, you know, we don't know. Sometimes we have to say, has the athlete just fallen into tradition? But I have to say that one thing we see with high performance environments, you got to remember, it's kind of like an evolutionary Petri dish in the sense that athletes you have a very clear goal run 10,000 meters as fast as you can or whatever it may be 
and and then you train and you get a very clear feedback did i get better did i get closer to that goal if not then training methodologies that don't work tend to go away just like you know they it's kind of like they become extinct and training methods that work tend to come into the the fold of, of, of training. And what we've seen is that multiple groups, the cyclists, the runners, the, 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 the cross country skiers from different parts of the world that don't talk to each other, there seems to have been a self-organizing process that has brought them to the same place. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. so all, all so, of these athletes, they're, they're doing endurance sports and basically what they're doing sort of coalesce around the same same. Uh, yeah, they, they, they call intensity. it self-organizing. You know, there is a self-organizational property that as you train more and you try to get better, certain processes, the, the recovery demands, maybe glycogen limitations, there's a number of things that probably all play together to our evolutionary heritage, almost certainly, uh, and now we're even seeing signaling pathways that kind of underpin or support this this approach where a lot of your training is is a, at a fairly low intensity aerobic you know this under under the threshold like the uh, like the pursuit hunters of our of our you know our our heritage would would have been that they would just wear out the animal by chasing them at a at a slow jog. You know, and we know this is part of our evolutionary heritage. This is what we're good at as humans is is low intensity running. Uh, we're built for it. We can get rid of heat and all these different things. So it looks like even in our evolutionary heritage, there is this fun foundational signaling process around both adapting to that long type of work. And then we need some of that high intensity. Sometimes we're chasing the antelope and sometimes the lion is chasing us, right? And so so then we need both. And and it seems like it's built into our our genetics. But oh. but also athletes have experimented with this, coaches have experimented over decades and decades and and and, and the self-organization has happened. Yeah, and I guess that question, I thought it was a, that's why I included that one, because I thought it was a really interesting sort of, not a counterpoint, but kind of just a more of a conceptual question that's that's really hard to answer because not many, as you said, there's been an evolution of, of training whereby things that don't work are generally not used anymore. Um, but he, he was kind of coming at an angle of um, what if we did this, but... Um, well, and, it, and it's fair. I mean, it's it's definitely fair to, to always challenge these. And I, I've said this, I remember at a lecture in Kent, I said, look, I have done this research, this is what I've seen, but I am now kind of biased because I've seen so much of it. If I'm wrong, it probably won't be me that demonstrates that, it'll be you. And so we need to always be critical. And, and it's good that this individual is critical or at least questioning it but but we can do those experiments it, it is it is a testable hypothesis for sure and um, i suppose the only problem with that is that when we're looking at elites very few are going to um volunteer for a study where you dramatically change their program and uh look to change their intensity distribution yeah, that's yeah that's true but but it does happen you know i you know you <laughs> I've I just before I started this, I was speaking with an athlete that has won multiple Olympic medals and that is going to try to do something pretty crazy and switch events, switch sports and 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 is looking at the entire training process freshly to see what what do I need to do a bit differently? You know, so athletes are athletes take chances, too, and they try new things and they ex are experimental. And uh, so I, I think we need to except they're not as steeped in tradition as you might think they're looking for a winning edge you know yeah, uh, so sure. i i think they do until they see that there's a clear reason to change yeah you're i i agree they're not going to just change but they're not totally inflexible in the way they train sure and um I guess it things might change as well with with age with endurance athletes as well in terms of oh yeah you know, recovery and that type of thing. But anyway, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll go back onto the uh, to the brief of the questions. This one comes back onto uh, to interval training, and it's from uh, Neil. He's asked, "What are your thoughts on sprint interval training for endurance athletes?" 
Do you think these are an effective way to improve endurance performance? We don't see a lot of that, to be honest. Uh, again, it's one of those issues that if you haven't been doing much of anything, then it's very easy to generate a, an adaptive stimulus. So sprint intervals definitely work on untrained. But once you have athletes that are quite well trained, that have high mitochondrial density, high capillary density, and so forth, then the impact of that sprint intervals type session is, is very small or non-existent, but the cost is pretty high. You know, so then we're starting to, we may be interested in, in some adaptations associated with buffering capacity, as we call it, with ability to tolerate high uh, or a low pH and so forth. And that is an adaptable process, but we're not going to do that kind of work all the time because it's so stressful and it's fresh fruit, and meaning that the adaptation is a kind of a soft, it's, it's, it's protein adaptations that aren't really structural, so it will decay quickly as well. Does that make sense? It, it, it does, yeah. And I mean, just through, I've looked into different HIIT protocols quite a bit last year when I was writing up um, a chapter of, of my book. And one thing that came through the literature quite consistently is with shorter, sort of very high or maximal intensity intervals, they tend to improve sort of more peripheral adaptations. But if you want more, so the, one of the previous questions was about VO2 max and in they duration seems to be more important when it comes to high intensity interval training um so like four by four minutes tend to be more effective at improving vo2 max than the sprint protocols but when you look at sort of less trained individuals as you just mentioned pretty much anything produces a quite a high signal um that's right to the cardiorespiratory system and the muscles and you get a a response but in terms of more trained people volume of the the hit seems to be more important for those more central adaptations right and 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 i think historically we have tended to kind of be a little bit too black and white and differentiate differentiate and say this kind of training is for the heart and this other kind of training is for the muscles where in reality there's a great deal of overlap you know, and, and, and there is a, there's even a fancy word for this functional symorphosis, meaning that, you know, you typically are not going to see an athlete with a really high VO2 max that doesn't also have a pretty high lactate threshold because the central adaptations, the cardiac increase in stroke volume, the blood volume increase, and the mitochondrial changes, the capillary density, they are happening together. They are co-adapting. Uh, and even in animals, you know, the, the athletic animals, they have very high mitochondrial density and the big heart that you don't get the one you don't usually see one without the other because the body is efficient in, you know, you know, what I'm saying we, yeah, sure. we, don't, we don't generate, we don't use a lot of energy on one adaptation if it's not going to be useful and it's not going to be useful if, if, if there's not peripheral adaptations to support it. Sure. So, and that, so there's a lockstep going on here. And with, with the interval training, um, do you think sometimes the protocols can kind of merge into one because of um, if people don't um, modify the recovery period with the intensity? So by that, I mean, if someone is doing a sprint interval uh, protocol, to me, a sprint is maximal all out 100 percent effort. But then they have a short recovery period, then if you look, look at their average heart rate over the course of a session, it's going to be, because of the short rest period, it'll be largely the same as doing a longer block with a, um, an equal rest period, if, if that makes yeah. sense. Oh, yeah, and, and you can see that, and we've done these experiments where you can take, for example, a popular protocol is something like a 30-15, you know, 30 seconds on, 15 seconds off, or 40-20, uh, these kinds of things, and and then then you, uh, one of the very popular, uh, one of my colleagues in Norway has gotten his name hooked to an interval session called the run a interval session, which is 13, 30, 15s, you know, basically 10 minutes. Uh, you can't, it doesn't get exactly to 10, but it's 10 minutes of work and then uh, three or five minute recovery and then a new block of 30, 15s. But what do you see? Well, at first the heart rate will kind of do a little bit of a sawtooth and then it just 
keeps going up and flattens out. And so basically that athlete is going between, you know, it may be between 450 watts and 150, but their heart rate is at 92% the whole way. The heart rate is just basically corresponding to the overall oxygen demand, right? And, and so, yeah, exactly. I always talk about the central point of view. The central point of view is, well, it's, this is a 10 minute interval, yeah. right? Whereas the peripheral point of view is some fluctuation in fiber type uh, uh, recruitment, which may be quite useful in a, from a, triggering adaptations and being able to deal with that stochastic work, that highly variable intensity that we see in cycling and other events. So there's two different viewpoints, the central and the peripheral that are somewhat different, but they, uh, they both have their, their role. If that makes sense. Yeah, sure. And I, th I think you do this um, quite nicely on, on Twitter is you know, when you post your sort of heart rate traces from different training sessions. And I, I do that in a couple of the practicals I do with students where we do different interval protocols and then we look at it. And it is quite interesting when you look at something, say, like uh, Tabata training, which is that sort of 20 seconds on 10 seconds off. And then when you look at the heart rate trace, because the recovery periods are so short, um, it, what it actually looks like is just kind of a continuous session because yeah. you know, heart rate never you never really get that recovery you get little dips but it gives you a sort of like a continuous block above sort of ninety percent of maximum heart rate um, which is kind of probably how it was so effective and um, particularly in the original study is that accumulated yeah. time spent close to VO two max. Yeah. So so again, there's no one magic formula because there's many ways to achieve the basic goal which is to drive stroke volume and heart rate up for some number of minutes right to get that signal uh, for adaptation and, and what adapts well the first thing that adapts is probably stroke uh, plasma volume we get more blood uh, the plasma volume increases and that's a fairly fast adaptation and it's kind of a chicken and egg question issue, but if the plasma volume goes up, blood volume goes up, then that means that you have more return of blood to the heart. So the heart gets a bigger stretch and we get higher stroke volumes. And then in response to that stretch, the, the heart, we get a triggering of a compensatory hypertrophy. So we get a bit of a change in muscle mass in the heart to do it so that the stretch is proportional. The cell, the walls of the heart, uh, get bigger in, in proportion to the bigger volume. So it's, everything is elegantly matched. Uh, but it looks like that one of the drivers is that initial increase in, in blood volume and more venous return and more stretch on the heart. So we're just, we're using the same, a bit of the same signals that we would use to train the biceps. Mm. And, um, speaking of, um, cardiac output and, and that leads us nicely on to um, a question from Jeremy, which is, I've often read that intervals should be done around VO2 max pace, um, but how can you determine this, and he means VO2 max pace, if you haven't done a VO2 max test in a lab? Is there some sort of track test I could use to approximate this pace? All right, I'm going to give it to you straight here. When you're breathing like this, <laughs> you're there. You don't need to be at VO2 max. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, the breathing is a truth teller. Uh, you know, no, I'm, I'm joking a little bit. But to be honest, to be very honest, you're, you're really not going to be at VO2 max during an interval session. That's too high of a load. And, and even in top athletes, I mean, I've looked at so much data from uh, elite cyclists, for example, and, and, and they never hit maximum heart rate in a race, in a five hour, six hour race. Because by the time they get to the end of six hours, there, there's quite a lot of fatigue going on, but they will be at 90% quite a lot. And, and in general, again, we're back to this issue that when we're training to, to improve the, the oxygen transport system, it turns out that if we can get up to around 90%, that's enough. That's high enough. 90, 91, 92. Now, if you do a four times, let's say you do four times eight minutes or six times four, it doesn't really matter. What you'll see is you may, your first interval, you may be at 87% of max heart rate. 
And by the end, you're at 93% of max heart rate. You, and it's you're running the same speed or the same power. So you're holding exactly constant. But what are you feeling? It's getting tougher and tougher and tougher. So your perceived exertion is a good tool that in an interval session that's in this kind of VO2 max development type of session, you probably want to start that session where the first interval feels like a, say, a 15. So hard. On the, on the Borg scale. On the Borg right. scale. Yeah, the from, 6 which to 20. The, 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 the 6 to 20 scale. I always still use the 6 to 20 scale because it just has more, sure, yeah. more points. So let's say you'll, you'll start at a 15, and then you should end up at the end at a 17, 18. Not 20. We usually will see that they've got, they've, they've got one in the bank still that they could go one more if they needed to. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, and as a ballpark figure, because I know a lot of people sort of like certainty at the start, if they've not done much interval training, would you say things like the the 12 minute like Cooper run or uh, could be used? And one thing that I've usually used with athletes or people that are new to running is um, uh, Jack Daniels, famous exercise physiologist, produced sort of these V dot calculation tables and they give you a kind of rough ballpark figure would, would you say that any of those are kind of useful for someone that's maybe not in tune to their own sort of perceived exertion yeah and i think that's a good thing to do and also one of the things that i think is useful is to actually find out what is my maximum heart rate yeah uh, because that is you know our window into the motor and and maximum heart rate gives us a really good calibration but, you know, if you use 220 minus age or one of these typical formulas, it works on average for 5,000 people. Sure. But at the individual level, it can be just completely wrong. Uh, that's so, interesting. This last one of the practicals that um, I do on, on uh, our module is we predict maximum heart rate using um, a Tanaka equation, which is one of the more recent ones. But then right. we actually do a, a, a ramp test to achieve max heart rate. And you're right. I mean, for some people it's within 5%, but others is like 15, sometimes 20% difference. So yeah. actually measuring your own max heart rate is, is definitely a useful thing to do. Yeah. And so how do I, you say, well, well, how do I do that? That sounds tough. Yeah, it's, it's tough, but it's not, not crazy tough. And, and what I would do if I'm working with recreational athletes, I would bake it into a tough interval session. So you're already going to work hard. And let's say you were going to do something like six times four minutes. And so then I'd say, all right, go ahead and do a couple of those bouts and get the, get the engine cranking pretty good. So you're hitting 90%, 92% heart rate. And then like about on that third interval, give it full gas and really push that heel is for what you're worth. And let's see what your heart rate ends up at. And then that heart rate will be, close enough it'll at least be getting you you know it may be plus minus a couple of beats but it'll be a reasonable indicator and it'll help us know whether you're a 180 or a 190 or a 200 and that's a big that's important for programming that kind of a difference but 180 versus 182 that's not that important yeah yeah some really really good points there and this this next question is actually um from one of my colleagues um tom uh, and it's similar to the last one, but on just looking at a different threshold. So how can people gauge their lactate threshold pace without laboratory testing? So the, the first threshold. Great question. Yeah, uh, there's a number of ways. Again, here's what I would say. First, uh, heart rate you have. And so I would say, if, let's say you're going to do an hour easy run you you've let the first 15 minutes be your warm up and it's literally a warm up because core temperature is increasing which influences heart rate so you give it 15 minutes and then if you're holding a steady pace then that heart rate should be where it needs to be by 10 or 15 minutes in and it should stay pretty, pretty flat you shouldn't see it just moving up 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 it should be staying flat so that's a good indicator that you're below and then as you inch up the pace and you start getting to that point where it starts drifting up well then you've crossed over into that second zone or that above that first turn point so that's one kind of poor person's indicator but it's a useful indicator in, in training in general another is is that uh, that you can the talking pace or some people use you can do mouth closed breathing uh, 
while you're cycling or running and, and generally that most people won't be able to get too far above their threshold in a talking pace or a mouth closed pace. So that's a indicator. It's not perfect, but it's, it's, it's one of the, a set of indicators. Another is if you do a 60, 90 minute ride or run and you can come straight in off the bike or off the, you know, running and go straight to the dinner table, then that's a good indication that you stayed below that threshold. Now, why is that? Well, that's because normally if you start, if you get above the first threshold, we start to see a sympathetic, a, a, a sympathetic response. We start to see the sympathetic nervous system really kicking in. And what that does is move blood out of the stomach. We move blood towards the muscle. The brain starts saying, goes into fight or flight mode, right? And so then it takes a while for, for you to settle back in and get your appetite back if you've been kind of pushing it a bit. So if you feel like I can go straight to the spaghetti table, the, the pizza buffet, that's a good sign that you didn't trigger that response. And then the fourth indicator I'll give you is that generally what we see is that when you're doing that low intensity extensive work, your brain can be thinking about something else. Yeah. Your, your brain can be outwardly focused, seeing the birds, hearing the, hearing the, you know, the or smelling the roses and so forth but once you start pushing into threshold range the brain tends to kind of move inward because now the intensity is getting tougher and the brain is starting to to scan its it, the body if that makes sense so none of those is perfect in their alone but put them all together and they give you a pretty decent um a, a toolbox yeah, and that, those are really nice points because none of them revolve around technology. And um, I, as I've worked with different athletes and recreational athletes over the years, one thing I've seen is an increased use on um, GPS and fitness trackers and the use of GPS data. And um, what the problem can be with that, at least in, from what I've seen, is sometimes people lose confidence in their ability to kind of self-regulate pace um uh, there was one case actually where um a runner she was a pretty good runner sub three three hour marathon and her um gps uh, device stopped working in the late second half of the marathon and she completely fr blew up because she, she her pacing was just off so i think there's a lot to be said for that sort of self-regulation and those kind of internal cues to to monitor your own pace and regulate it as well absolutely so in fact we you know we often when you go into the ring or you go in, you put on the starting line, you should, you're going to be in a sense naked. You're not going to have all that technology. You need to trust this. So we, we need to train the brain. We can, we can help use the technology to calibrate our perceptions and, and zero in on that. But ultimately when you're in that race, this is the most amazing tool you have is is your sense of pace your highly tuned brain that is connected to everything so don't what should we say don't abandon the most sophisticated technology you have and then this that's a really nice um segue to the next question uh, which is from tom as as well and he's put um how much do you trust do you have in emerging technology to quantify training stress and recovery? For example, training peaks, uh, performance chart manager, Garmin acute training load, etc. cetera. <laughs> um, I don't trust any of that. Uh, but, but, but now let me qualify that. And what I'm trying to say is they're all, I know Dirk Friel, I know the guys at training peaks, I, they're all doing the best they can to give you some metrics, but, even they would say, don't trust any one metric. So acute training load or TSS or whatever, if it helps you to kind of keep track of what you're doing, that's great. But in general, I, I now I'm going to go back to one of my triad preaching sermons. And that is that basically with training monitor, monitoring, I would argue that you need you should use at least pretty regularly three different kinds of information. One is something about the external load, the actual pace or the power, right? And we've never had better tools than we have now for being able to get a handle on that. And then you should use some physiology, 
what do we have? We've got heart rate, we've got lactate, maybe heart rate variability is kind of a, a an indicator. Uh, we don't need to measure VO2 and you can't do that very easily. We're starting to play with measuring ventilation with breathing because it tells us a lot and it's moving out into the field, but some physiology and heart rate has been the most used tool. And then that third part of the triangle is, is perceived exertion, perception. Just saying, how do I feel? How does this feel? And putting those three together gives you a kind of a, uh, a checks and balances system because none of them are perfect by themselves, but put them together and they give you a decent toolbox for monitoring your process. And what we're really interested in is understanding is the internal cost or the, the load of doing this external work changing mm -hmm. in, a, in a positive way or in a negative way. And, and if I'm tired, for example, very often we'll see that the internal responses are changing relative to the, the typical 200 watts, let's say, that I normally would do for a two hour ride. And, and it can, the tricky thing here is folks, if you use heart rate, let's say, heart rate can go both up or down at that typical uh, power. And both of those can be bad or both of those can be an indicator that you're tired. And then you're saying, well, Stephen, you got to choose one. You can't be both. Well, it actually can. Because let's say you did a really tough strength session and you've got some delay, you know, doms and your muscles are tired and that, and then you go out and you try to run and your, your heart rate may be a bit high for mm -hmm. that pace. So that's one situation that would be pretty typical. And then, but another situation is, hey, I've been doing a pretty heavy load. I've been training quite a few days in a row and, and a lot of volume. And now you say, man, I can't seem to get my heart rate up. That suppression of heart rate during. Yeah. And it's, it's even got a fancy name, parasympathetic hyperactivity. Mm -hmm. And, and so the, the heart rate is 10 beats lower than normal. Now this is the one you have to be careful about because if you misinterpret that one, your heart rate is suddenly 10 beats lower than normal. Then you say, Hmm, I guess I need to go harder. I made that mistake myself. When yeah, that happened, it's, 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 sure makes, it's easily to do, to do for sure. That's a kill. That's a bad. That's the bad choice. So you want to because what what we see is if if it's ten beats lower, you know what else is ten beats lower? Your max heart rate. Mm -hmm. you know what else is ten beats lower? Your heart rate at lactate threshold. The whole thing. The whole system is depressed. Yeah. And so then you got to just keep it keep it chill and let your body let that parasympathetic or, or the autonomic nervous system recover you know and then you're back in action so this is heart rate is a a double-edged sword or we gotta we have to be sensitive to it but any kind of big change from day to day should be seen as it's not a adaptive issue it's a fatigue issue yeah okay. and that latter point is, is, is a really good one because um, I've, I've had that myself where intuitively, if you're doing, say, an interval session and you know kind of what zone you should be getting towards and then you're not, then what you do is you push your external workload up to, to try and get that. And then you can make yeah. the situation worse because you're just putting stress upon stress and then it affects your recovery. And, yeah, you end up flogging yourself even more. And I've seen it with um, with athletes as well that, that use heart rate and it doesn't mar up with their usual pace. So then they increase pace and yeah, yeah. then you get into a world. So of one of the ways you can deal with that is just to be sensitive, be fairly consistent with your warm up at, at going into an interval session and then kind of get a feeling. How, how am I? Is the heart rate response normal? And then and if it doesn't feel quite right, when I've asked athletes what they do at that point, most of them will say, well, I will usually still start the interval session unless I just feel really bad. Then I may say, well, I wait till tomorrow, but they'll start the session and then do the first interval. And then if it still feels crappy, they'll, they'll shut it down, but they'll push themselves. They'll go through a warm up because sometimes that initial fatigue, you know, just getting moving and that, things get better and the athlete says, oh, the, the workout ended up being fine. So uh, they usually will not abandon a workout before they've given it a, a they've gone through the warm up and just see if that solves problems. And often it does.
Yeah, so de deciding what to do in the warm-up as opposed to not training right. at all. Or, or start the session. But then if, it, if your body's just not answering the call, then you have to be brave enough to say, okay, it's, I'm not going to get out of this what I'm putting into it. I'm going to, this is just draining my body because I'm fatigued. And you have to be willing to, to say, I'm going to take an extra day of rest. Cool. And that is, that's smart. That's what makes people good athletes. It's not, you know, being wimpy or whatever, you know, it, it is, it takes courage to do that. But that's what we see that good athletes will sometimes say, you know what? I'm not ready. I need to rest another day or I need to just keep this an easy workout and, and then tomorrow I'll do this session. And um, for sure. And I suppose that's how athletes can end up in that sort of black hole that you discussed, because if they do that session that they planned, it le needs more recovery. And then the next day they can't perform the intended session. So they, they, their intensity goes down and then they end up just doing kind of yeah. like, unplanned intensity like deloads if you like and, and you don't want to be locked into a plan plans are critical or plan let's, let's i think that eisenhower said planning is critical plans are useless what he was trying to say is yes of course we need to make plans but we also need to be prepared for the realities which is that things happen Mm -hmm. Our body, you know, we get sick, we get niggles, we get, and we have to be flexible in our execution of our, of these training plans. And, and one, what we see is that if you're too rigid, if you feel like you just are locked into the training plan, that is usually not a good, uh, there won't be a good outcome or it won't be as good as it should be. But athletes that say, you know, I listen to my body. Sometimes I realize I need to take a day off. And I do so, and I don't have a moment of, of, of regret, you know, they tend to stay healthy and, and they get, make progress, you know, so don't be afraid of rest days. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I guess that comes with um, listening to your, to your body, as you mentioned, and, and mm -hmm. not being sort of dictated to by technology. It's useful, but it doesn't, it shouldn't tell you what to do. It should kind of inform you and, Speaking of which, yeah. I'll go on to the, the next question, which is on this subject from Rafa. And he asks, um, can HRV, heart rate variability, be used to monitor fitness as well as recovery status? I, I wouldn't use heart rate variability as a, as a fitness tool, you know, because then it can lead you astray. But it can definitely be a help us to see where are we from a rec recovery standpoint. And I think I would have perfect agreement with that from say Marco Altini, who, you know, he's one of the best I know on, on heart rate variability. And he has that product, uh, heart rate variability, HRV for training.com or something like I think is called. Uh, so I don't think he would ever say use heart rate variability as a proxy for fitness. Do you, th do you think um, this person is coming at it from uh, maybe how some people use resting heart rate? which tends to decrease with um, endurance training experience. And is that probably the yeah, but, but even point? again, it's, it's, that's a blunt instrument. So it's not going to be, you know, uh, my resting heart rate is 37 if I'm in top shape and 39 if I'm not in great shape. You know what I mean? It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's not a really great tool to help me know wh whether I'm really fit because I just naturally have a low resting heart rate. If I were to just stop doing everything for three months, it would stop probably still be 50. So, so I don't think we can use resting heart rate as a, as a proxy for fitness uh, because what we see is it'll tend to go down as you strain, but then it flattens out. It doesn't just keep going down, down, down as you get better and better and better. Yeah, sure. Okay. There's, there's genetic components as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. As well. Um, Nez asks, um, back to sort of a programming question, uh, would you recommend including resistance training before or after a long run or on a separate non-running day? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. And and I've asked athletes this thousand responses and it's it's like all over the place. Uh, and, and the research you know, we'll go in a bit different directions. Generally, we'll say that your main, your priority training session is what you're going to do first. You know, that would be one way of approaching it. Uh, 
for the endurance athlete who is not a strength specialist, I don't think it matters that much in the sense that these, these two don't cancel each other out. You know, we've talked a lot about, uh, the, there's some, some, um, you know, concurrent training issues and so forth, but that's it. Yeah, a little, but it's not that big. And, and so I would argue to people say, look, do what is practical for you. If it is practical for you to do a morning workout in the gym and get some strength training and, and then do a cycling session in the afternoon, because that's how, that works out with your job and everything, do that. Because if it's practical, it's more likely you'll be able to do it regularly. And that's much more important than any small issues associated with optimizing which one do I do first and all this. If there's several hours between the workouts, then it's enough that the interference effect is very is tiny. Yeah, sure. And um, what, have you come across some? I, I know a few, a few athletes that, that um, have sort of like grouped resistance training on and like by stress. So, like if they're doing a hard run or cycle day, like an interval session, they'll do their resistance training on that day as well. And then they, the the premise is that then they, they can use their recovery time. They need more recovery going into the next session. So they kind of put the hard stuff all on one day. Is that something you've come across or you've got any thoughts? Yeah. On that? And I think, I, I think actually there's a good logic to that. And I would, I would support that. And we've seen that a lot with, with athletes, they will do sometimes double hard sessions on one day, or well, I give you an example. You could take someone like uh Jakob Ingebrigtsen, the 1500 meter uh, gold medalist in the Olympics. And, uh, I know that in certain times when they've done races, they'll say, well, we did a warm up, we turned on the whole system, we did a race, but it really wasn't that much training. So then they would do an interval session after a race. Wow. Yeah. Why? Well, because they're aligning, they're saying, if we're going to first turn on this big stress response, so let's align it so that now the recovery clock is, is lined up. And, yeah, and that, that, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, because if you the 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 problem that people will face, whether it's my daughter as a runner or whatever, is we have these different components to the training that we want to push put in to the program, and they you know the strength training has it has some stress. It, it's going to create some wear and tear on the muscles, some DOMS and so forth. So you're trying to balance this all out so that you keep the recovery on average we need to be recovering every 24 hours, right? We need to be kind of back to baseline every 24 hours on average, because if we're not, then the bank account is going to slowly go the wrong direction. And, and so that is kind of when we're doing programming in the weekly process, that's what we need to achieve. And, and it can make sense then to align a couple of different hard stimuli on the same day and then mentally know now I've got two, two days in a row, low intensity, just, just doing the work. And that's going to give me recovery time or maybe even three days, right? Sure. So we line up that clock instead of having, you know, every other day we're doing something kind of hard. Yeah. And, um, I think well, I, I did a webinar with, um, a colleague of mine, Richard Blagrove, who's done a lot of work in resistance training for endurance athletes. And one of the things we discussed there was sort of microdosing. So the, the basically not having to do all your resistance training in one designated session, but sort of like dosing it out across the week so that you kind of manage fatigue better. But we won't get down that rabbit hole. But just if anyone's interested. In yeah, that. there's different ways. It, it, it depends a little bit on what you're trying to achieve. You know, a lot of strength training for a, an athlete like a cyclist is not necessarily trying to directly train the quads to make yeah. me a better cyclist, but I'm trying to train other muscles to give myself a balance that's going to help prevent injuries and so forth. So doing that kind of work, core stability or extension yeah. work and so forth, I can do that and, and not have that impact my cycling versus I can go in the gym and do a killer squat workout and then get sore and then that's going to impact two cycling sessions in a row in a negative way so so it depends on what you're trying to achieve with the strength training sure um Stephen, we're coming up to the hour now is it okay if i would squeeze one last question in sure okay um josh will be pleased with me for this because uh yeah it came in uh, yesterday uh, 
would you apply polarized training or could you apply it within team sports? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I, you know, we even did a study on football, for example, soccer, uh, and, and you don't, you cannot do high quality on ball training moderato. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, yes. It's not suited to the, the nature of the sport. Yeah. You can't do a 65% max yeah. shot or whatever. So, so the answer to that at one level is no. It's, you know, these are apples and oranges, so I don't want to try to go into that, you know, the team sports. But on the other side of this, there is, we do see, we see it with sprinting, we see it with team sports, we see it with MMA, mixed martial arts, that there is an ebb and flow to the training process that you can't go out every day and push all full guns. MMA fighters, they don't do it. You, say, you can't get hit in the face every day. Uh, team sports either. So, so there is an ebb and flow in terms of, of the density of, of sprinting and so forth. So they're usually in the weekly cycle of football players, there'll be maybe two weeks in the middle between games where they'll do some, some pretty decent hard work, but then a lot of recovery, you know, because they have to. So there's a, there's a nice rhythm. They have to put in a rhythm in their training that allows them to sustainably be able to be not peaked, but be ready for games, essentially, at least once a week, sometimes more than once a week at the highest levels, but once a week for, for a lot of, you know, lower levels. And yeah, I suppose there's been a trend as well in the, uh, the last few years as well, and what's termed off feet conditioning in team sports, where you see a lot of teams now using cycling, um, indoor cycling, as a, as a low intense or low stress way of, of kind of yeah. maintaining cardio uh, vascular fitness um, between games as well, also for players that aren't getting game time as well. That's right. And, and, and we got to remember team sports, I, I played American football and man, I tell you what, after a game, you just almost couldn't get out of the bed because you're so beat up because of all the physical, literally physical trauma. And, and, and we, so it's not appropriate you know, sometimes my endurance athlete friends, even my own daughter, they are saying, all oh, these silly football guys, they don't train hard because if you count hours of training, it doesn't add up to the same that we see in the elite endurance people. But the elite endurance athletes aren't getting, you know, smacked down. They're, you know, they're not, they're not dealing with all the trauma, the physical trauma. So we should be careful. I, I always say, you, you don't count out, don't, compare hours of training because those hours are very different. And, and so I have a lot of respect for that reality when it comes to team sports, um, you know, yeah. it's, app it's apples and oranges. And also that, that they do, there needs to be a rhythm to their training. They can't be the same every day. A hundred percent. I think one of the things that people don't appreciate with them, um, if they haven't played a team sport is, it's the unpredictable nature of the stress that really can prolong recovery. You've got the acceleration, deceleration in the case of American football and rugby oh, yeah. packs as well. And you can't plan those like you can in endurance training. So I'm going to do this amount, you know, how long your run is going to be, for example, you don't know how many times you're going to get hit and how many sprints you're going to do in a team sport. So it's, it's, it's one yeah, of the reasons yeah. more difficult to, to program for. I think you could take the average, runner or cyclist and say and put them out on the rugby pitch and don't you know don't hit them but just have them try to to move with the same frequency and sprint and they'd be gassed in five minutes because it's such a different pattern of activity so there is a specificity to that that we need to respect and and so you can be a top trained cyclist with 20 hours a week in your legs and you go out on a basketball court and you're gassed in five minutes yeah, yeah, can't can't get out of bed the next day as well. No, so so uh, and it doesn't get better when you get older. I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, I'm still trying to play football and finding that's the case as well. Yeah, um, yeah. But Stephen, uh, we've gone over the hour now, so um, uh, I just want to say thanks very much for um, agreeing to do uh, this Q and A. I found it really useful, and I'm sure uh, everyone else in the audience has as well. I'm sorry I didn't get through all of your questions, but um, unfortunately we, we've run out of time.
Uh, but um, yeah, just just wanted to say thanks very much for joining us today, Stephen. Well, thank you, and I hope it was useful, and we'll we'll have to do it again. <laughs>